Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. This time out, we are joined by sound designer, remixer, composer, DJ, music artist of all types, <laughs> Richard Devine. Thanks Pleasure for being here. Be here. Appreciate you coming out to uh, to see us. You're here on behalf of Tune Track, and we're we'll doing a uh, workshop tonight, right? That's right. Yep. Yeah, I'm working uh, with the Easy Drummer Two and the uh, Beat Station, and I also did a Easy uh, X library for them called it Electronic, which was based around circuit bent um, toys and instruments, um, malfunctioning speak and spells, and all sorts of odd, right? Um, you know, audible circuit bent oddities, if you will. Right. Stuff, right. So. Let's create stuff in there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fun stuff. Fun yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. So I understand you actually started out studying piano at age eight. Is that right? I did. Yes. Um, How did that come about? How did you get started? That was purely just my mom wanting me and my brother to play. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, an instrument be a little more well-rounded. Uh, and at that age, me and my brother were really not interested in playing piano or any instrument. We were like. We want to play in the creek and catch poisonous snakes. <laughs> we don't want to play piano. We thought it was like the most uncool thing. Um, and I went through a, a steady stream of different piano teachers over the years from that point. And mm -hmm. It wasn't until my last piano teacher, because I was just sight reading and, you know, just basically like reading a book in a way. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't really playing from an, an emotional aspect of taking any, anything away from the music. It was just being being able to play it correctly and... Um, the technical aspect of learning how to sight read, and um, and my last piano teacher was was teaching me more based off of playing me different things, and then having me find stuff that I like, mm -hmm. like trying to find some emotional connection to the music, which he thought was more important than getting the technical aspect, which is what all my other piano teachers were were not teaching me. Right. Um, and I thought that was really cool, and that's how I, I just discovered the music music of Eric Satie and. Mm -hmm. Um, Bach and some of these composers that were doing some really interesting things that I thought that were kind of, there was something um, that struck me that I was like, I want to hear that again. That sounded cool. I love this part or right. this movement. And um, that kind of was like the first spark, mm -hmm. if, if you will, of getting into uh, actually being like, hey, I kind of, there's something about this that's speaking to me that, you know. And uh, from that point, I started getting into music a lot more seriously. Mm -hmm. Got into learning to play guitar, drums, bass, um, other instruments, and um, I was a skateboarder for a number of years, about uh -huh. 10 years. Right. You know, with skateboard culture comes, uh, the music that comes with that is a lot of thrash metal, right. there's hip hop and, and things. So it was this whole, the whole art and everything about it was, was bringing this whole DIY aspect of making music, you know, kind mm -hmm. of the punk band in the garage you know, right, kind of right. thing, and I, I love that aspect too, so I just, be, just became this sponge, mm -hmm. uh, absorbing um, different forms of music, studying different forms of music and, and art as well. Um, so I was a vis I'm a visual artist as well as a, as a musician, so I've just been naturally drawn to all those things. Right. Fa just fascinated by it all, really. Right. I still am to this day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how did you make the move from, from Satie and Debussy and, and those, those uh, composers you cited on the piano to much more avant-garde things like Morton Sabotnik and uh, Parch and uh, Stockhausen and, and people like that that are generally more academic, you know, academic artists are more into that kind of a thing, punk, that totally. thrash metal to then becoming a <laughs> DJ at age 16. How did all that happen? That it's it, my journey from there was really interesting. Yeah, you you had mentioned the 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 punk bands and early thrash metal stuff. I uh, made the natural progression to industrial music, which mm -hmm. was around the I would say the late yeah late 80s. I started to kind of discover bands like SPK, Coil, um, Skinny Puppy, some of the Canadian. Industrial groups, where they were taking elements of what I liked about hip hop music, some of, sort of the synthetic sample stuff that was happening, and, and incorporating that with more mechanical machine type um, you know, of, of a sound that was darker and edgier. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love that it was almost like infusing things that I liked about punk music and hip hop music into this new form of music that was kind of a you know, emerging at the time, and uh, I found that just super fascinating, and a lot of these groups were doing a lot of experimental things and making references to, you know, people like Stockhausen or Sinakis and um, these other composers. So I started to research quite a bit during that time mm -hmm. and discovered other things, and, uh, and around that same time I started to buy synthesizers. 
analog synthesizers, anything I could get my hands on, a lot of early drum machines, digital and analog. Um, so I would be on the constant quest, you know, hitting up pawn shops every weekend, buying stuff, whatever I could get my hands on. Right. And um, I was buying a lot of stuff that was broken too, just because I was able to get it cheap. I was like, you know, maybe I could find someone to help me fix this stuff. And um, a lot of the early Oberheim sequential circuit stuff that I was buying, I, I was looking up in the, there was a local paper in Atlanta, you know, tech repairs, we'll repair your old ARP. And I was like, oh, this guy's perfect. Right. Contacted him and it was a, a guy named Richard Goodsell who had a shop that was um, reconditioning and fixing old Hammond B3s, but they would also service older analog stuff. Mm -hmm. And they introduced me to their tech in their department, which is a guy named Tim Adams, um, who now has passed away. Um, but he was an amazing person um, as far as teaching me the basic fundamentals of you know early electronic, not only these early instruments that I was buying, but also some of the history and some of the people using the stuff behind it. And he had an incredible record collection. Mm. And he, when he was moving out of his apartment, he basically said, my wife's making me get rid of all the records. <laughs> these have all got to go. And I basically, and then I was probably 17, 18 years old at the time. Actually, I was 18 years old at the time when I got these records. So I was mm -hmm. really at a time in, where I was extremely impressionable and ready to just get my mind blown by anything. Right. And uh, in this collection, there was everything from, you know, the Princeton series with Barry Verco doing the first, like, you know, computer music compositions at Bell Labs right. to Morton Subotnick. This is how I discovered um, Silver Apples of the Moon, you know, Sidewinder. Um, this, this entire era of music I had no idea about. Right. Um, and it was just kind of all getting slammed with it at once. So I would just study these records every night after school. I'd be like, I couldn't r wait to get home to listen to all these records I had got. And um, it was a, it was like the craziest education you could get at yeah. that point in time. And it, it was for me at the time. I was so naive. I thought that the music I was listening to was the most advanced. Oh, this is the craziest music you could listen to. And then. <laughs> You know, I heard Morton Subotnick, and it totally blew me away. Right. I had just the just the nature of how he composed the, the, his pieces was so organic, mm -hmm. and the uh, the approach was was just so radical compared to working with a you know a sixteen step linear bass drum sequencer or, or using Cubase at the time. Um, everything sounded right. so rigid to me, but everything that they were doing was just so organic and free form. It sounded like organisms growing and multiplying and fading away and decaying and you know nothing sounded linear about it at all it was right. kind of um, it was just very different and you know also discovering John Cage and and Stockhausen and, and some of their approaches and how radical they were and then it just led me into this this Donnie Darko rabbit hole of there's a whole world there isn't there <laughs> a of, whole of, uh, world really of interesting insanity stuff. interesting yeah. stuff and uh, it, it, had I not had that early on I think my my path might have been completely different. Right, right. But because of that, I was really, it, it, it was a big turning point for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is that what led you into your interest in, in getting into the more computer software-based side of things, like C-Sound and some of the, uh, you know, some of those sound processing and DSP-based programs that you work Absolutely, on? yeah. Uh, I still use a lot of those today. I'm a big uh, user of Cycling 74s, uh, Max MSP, Max for Live, and then um, C sound I still use quite often, mm -hmm. um, and I'm a big Kima user, Super Collider, any of the environments where you can kind of just start with nothing if you just think of something. And a lot of times, I may not compose an entire piece within those environments, but a lot of times it's great to just be like, hmm, I want to do something that's a little odd. And right. you know, in in most conventional, you know, DAW environments and stuff, to do those little stranger things, sometimes it could be a little bit of a be a little difficult, so it's nice mm -hmm. to be able to go in an environment and construct something, you know, like in Max or Reactor. I'm a big Native Instruments user as well, and um, right. just kind of make something, make something that you know, make a little weird instrument or a, you know a synthesizer or some sort of processing right. um, module that does something, and uh, I, and I just love that to mm -hmm. me that you know, and that also kind of happens in the hardware form with modular synthesizers. I've been doing a lot of work with uh, analog modular stuff and uh, I work very much the same way in that world too. Just kind of start from nothing and then patch up and right. see what happens. And right. Kind of create this little environment that can 
generate, sometimes generate things for you that are unexpected. May, it may give you something that you were looking for. It may give you something that you weren't even looking for that's even cooler than what you were trying to come up with. Um, or, you know, it might be something that's completely useless. <laughs> right, right, you never know. Right, <laughs> you right. just never know, and that's what I love about it, you know. It's just kind of throwing the dice out and see what happens. And, um, right, right. You know, it's super cool. One, one of the dangers with that and, uh, is that it's, it's so easy to get caught up in the process. It is. <laughs> um, and uh, obviously listening to your music, you're, you're very timbrely focused. I mean, you're, you're, you're all about the, the right sounds at the right times and, and making sure that's all crafted, crafted very, very, very accurately. How do you avoid that pitfall of getting so caught up in the process that you don't ever get around to making music? <laughs> that is a very, uh, that's a very difficult line to keep in balance, I guess. Um, with me, I usually work with deadlines. Deadlines are actually good for me. <laughs> if someone gives me a deadline and tells me I need to turn it in at that time, it, you know, or if they say, oh, whenever you want to turn it in, that's bad. You know, mm -hmm. take your time with it. I, I'm, I work much better when they say that, you know, we have to have everything in. We're doing our pressing or we're marketing, whatever needs to happen at this point, and um, I'll use those tools and, and I give, you know, I'll, I'll sort of cut the amount of time I have. I'll be like, all right, I've only got six hours to kind of come up with these kind of sounds that I want. I'll use these processes and usually I'll have all my favorite little tools that will generate this sort of things based on the idea that I want to, what the final outcome to be for this, either a remix or composition or a sound design uh, project. And uh, so I've Design my studio to to accommodate to work very quickly and efficiently at those times and stuff. And um, you know when I'm, I do do the experimental phases when I'm kind of you know late night. I've gotten my work done for the day. Then if I want to go back and kind of tinker on a little thing that I was I've kind of fell into, I'll kind of put it on pause for later later in the night. Right. And then I'll take the time for that. But when if it's if it comes to working on a track and getting into something, I I try to stay focused and keep, you know, make sure I actually turn in something. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. But uh, you can do, you can you know derive off the path quite often and and get into these really cool spaces where you're like, oh, this is pretty interesting. Although it's not what I'm supposed to be doing, but it's right. And that happens a lot. Um, I'll just put it on hold. Mm -hmm. I'll put it on hold and come back to it. You know, and, and always uh, just kind of save it. And, right. And um, but yeah, it can happen. <laughs> so it, it, it uh, relates to something I've, I've uh, read, read you having said several times in interviews where you work best within limitations. Yes. And so you kind of set up a framework that you work within. Is that how you approach doing that kind of a thing? Definitely, yeah. I mean, I have a lot of stuff. I'm Probably too much stuff for my own good. But um, I've always found that I work much better when I, I limit myself to just a few pieces of equipment or even one piece of equipment or just even the computer. I mean, I could do anything mm -hmm. with just a computer and a, and a mouse. Um, and um, yeah, I find that I'm more creative. I think I, I, I approach it more uh, that I need to solve a problem or I need to create something that um, that's interesting. You know, it doesn't necessarily always have to be about the tools. It's just about the ideas and and emotionally moving somebody some somebody some way mm -hmm. with sound. It doesn't necessarily have even have to be music. It could be just abstract sound design or or an arrangement of different sounds. Uh, in a piece to kind of move, move a person emotionally through, you know, a specific amount of time. So it's uh, right. Um, I find that for me that if I have too many things, I sort of get I run into all these weird, you know, I, I sometimes can't even make a decision on what to do. You know, sometimes we I'm call looking it option in, anxiety. Option anxiety. Yeah, yeah, I have that a lot when I look <laughs> in my AUVST folder of you know I have you know, sixteen hundred plugins. I'm like right. I don't even know. I don't even know Which what one to do you? use, you know? Sometimes right. I forget that I have stuff. I'm like, oh yeah, I need to use that more. That's a really cool. And so um, I, I try to just use stuff that gets me quick quick results quickly um, mm -hmm. and at the same time kind of just narrow down the group of tools that I might use for a specific project. Just a couple things so mm -hmm. that I'm more productive and I'm coming out with hopefully better results than... Right. trying to use everything at one time. Right, right. I, but I know people that do that, that can use tons of stuff and come up with great, um, you know, great songs and, and you know, great results, but I'm, I'm not one of those people that use 10,000s and right, right. You know, things to get something. But One of the keys to that, though, is, is being able to 
learn the gear thoroughly and quickly so you know what it's capable of and how far you can push it, or in your case, push it past that point exactly. to get you know, new and interesting sounds. <laughs> and, and you deal with so much of that because you do so much sound design. Absolutely. Uh, you know, new gear coming in all the time, and here's a brand new keyboard, maybe not even have a manual for it. How are you going to make sounds for it? How do you go about learning a piece of gear like that? Or do you, have, do you have advice for someone who needs to really get deep into a piece of gear? Oh, sure. I mean, yeah, that happens quite often. Um, often I will just sit down with an instrument that, that like, a company sent me, um, and I'll spend just a few hours just seeing what everything does, mm -hmm. you know, seeing what all the different modes, the different functions, what do the filters sound like, the envelopes, how far do those ranges extend, what do the effects sound like, and then I try listening to it in different combinations, and uh, just exploring mm -hmm. what, um, how expressive the instrument is using the built-in, you know, mod wheel or whatever, you know, velocity, whatever they have built into the instrument that allows you to um, control the sound in different ways is, uh, I'll just, my ears are always listening for stuff. I, I mm -hmm. think it's just kind of like a, an interview in a way, um, what the instrument, you know, what it's telling me, the kind of feedback I get, and then, um, and then I just start making sounds with it. I mm -hmm. think the best thing to do with uh, any instrument is just to kind of go jump into it. You know, it's like, let me make a couple bass sounds with it. Let me make a couple of pads. Let me make, right. you know, just with what's on board, what, what am I going to get back? You'll, you'll immediately start to get some feedback from the instrument that, you know, timbrely and, and what kind of tones and, you know, what kind of frequency range the instrument sits in. You know, it kind of tells you all kinds of different stuff. And then an exercise I like to do a lot with, uh, that I do with a lot of new plugins and new keyboards and stuff is I do a whole track with nothing but just using that instrument. Hmm. So I might make percussion sounds. Well, it's like, how good is this thing at making percussion sounds? Kicks, snares, hi-hats, toms, whatever, crashes, cymbals. I will make those, even if it's synthesis, mm -hmm. you know, I'll design those all and then I'll make a kit of sounds based off that, then I'll make, you know, the other parts of the arrangement with that instrument, and then see what it does for me, you know, what, what, see what sounds uh, that that instrument's more strong at making, or, mm -hmm. you know, areas that it's not, that I feel it's not so good at making, and then I, uh, then I'll go from there, then I'll, once I understand what it can do at the basic level, then I can take those basic ideas and then do more advanced things, and do tricky stuff, and use, you know, multi-stage envelopes, or whatever, and, you know, get into the really sort of elaborate, interesting sounds. And uh, so I do it at multiple different stages. And then um, if it's an instrument that I'm, I have a lot of interest in, or if it's, you know, you know, a company that wants me to design some sounds, that's usually the, uh, the route I take. Mm -hmm. I think a good example of that was uh, I worked with Clavi on the Nordlead 4. Mm -hmm. And I did a composition that, that's on their SoundCloud page where everything was, was generated from the Nordlead 4 to give the users an idea of, you know, what you could do, mm -hmm. or just maybe just one approach right. of how to use the instrument in a way where it's, everything's being generated, drums and even the sound effects and little trinkly sort of, uh, you know, particle sounds and stuff, and uh, I think it's a great exercise, I think. Yeah, you have no choice but to really get deep into it. If you hear a sound and you have to make that sound, you got to figure it out, right? you got to figure it out, and you'll yeah. learn a lot of things. You'll, you'll find that the instrument may do some, some will generate stuff that kind of surprise you, like, oh, that's cool, I've never heard a kind of sound like that before. That, you know, you'll discover things on the way, little mm -hmm. accidental, I call them sonic accidents that, right. you know, that kind of work out. And uh, it's just, a, I think it's a win-win situation. And in my studio, I've sold off a lot of stuff. I sold tons of gear, like, in the last two years. And right now, I'm just down to basically the collection of synths that I've worked with with companies over the years that I've kept. So uh, you know, everything that I have now I know extremely well because mm -hmm. I've either designed tons of sounds for them and you know I can go to them and almost like not even look at what I'm doing because I know them so well to get what I want really fast. So right. um, yeah, it's been a great, it's been fun. And it's, you learn stuff. I love learning new technologies and um, you know whether it's on, a, on the iOS platform or I mean there's just you know a, a new software environment. I'm, I'm constantly fascinated with new ways to generate, manipulate sound, coming up with cool sounds, and right. uh, that's just, you well, know. You're tremendously prolific at it. I mean, your name is on <laughs> so many different instruments, and, and app, you know, apps on the iP iPad mm -hmm. and different things, so totally. yeah, tons and tons of that stuff. I know, I have that. friends who are like, Rich, I can't get away from you. You're <laughs> everywhere. Oh. 
And it's I'm always like, fresh mm -hmm. stuff, and that's that's what's interesting is that it's always fresh. Mm -hmm. It's not like, well, I, I heard that sound already over here, over over here. So mm -hmm. you know, a lot of creative thought must have went into creating those sounds. Totally. I always try to do something different. Like you know, another example would be like the Nave app, the Waldorf. Mm -hmm. When I worked with them, they had I thought that was such unique synthesis. Uh, synthesis engine. Even today, I think it's one of the coolest iOS um, synthesizer app, apps to hit the market. And you just I'm a huge fan of wavetable synthesis in general, but I just thought combining that idea with just the, the multi-gesture point connectivity of being able to control things and the XY pads and that environment just lended itself to just making all kinds of crazy new stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just really inspiring to see, um, you know, a synthesizer like that that had, you know, that much controllability and, and taking advantage of this new technology. It, it allows you to make these new sounds that, you wouldn't normally be able to yeah. make. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, in your iPad. On your iPad. I, I, I am constantly blown away by yeah. stuff on the iPad. And, um, you know, I'm at a point now where, you know, I think the last project I did was with uh, Akai for the uh, MPC Pro app. Mm -hmm. Did all their songs and stuff. And I'm, I'm really fascinated that you could make music, like a full music composition on the iPad. You know, now yeah. I'm doing retronyms and I use a lot of the, the tabletop software. I use a lot of mm -hmm. their stuff. I'm good friends with those guys. And and uh, I, th I think it's just so awesome. You can go in the park, lay out on the grass, <laughs> and just, you know, you know need anything else. Headphones yeah. and make some... I, I, I think that concept's just awesome to me. Yeah. I love being able to take something that's small and portable and have that much power is just, I think it's, uh, I think it's awesome. But. Right, right, that's great, that's great. So you mentioned the word inspiration, and I, I found it very interesting that you draw a lot of inspiration from, and you mentioned being a visual artist, but from visual artists, but also architecture. Definitely. How does all that factor into the art that you create? Um, well, when I went to school, I didn't go to music school. Everyone asked me if I went to a music school. I wish I'd went to somewhere like Full Sail or... Berkeley, but uh, I went to uh, Kansas State University and I studied graphic design mm -hmm. there. And my, my major was in graphic, mostly web, um, working with Flash, Action Script, and um, we were using Lightwave, a lot of like 3D modeling programs. And um, so I was interested in visual art what, long before I was getting uh, that I was into music. I was drawing, mm -hmm. and I think I had the in high school, I was in AP art classes and like won all these awards, scholastic awards and stuff for my drawings and paintings and stuff. And I actually thought I was totally going to go in the visual art world the whole time because mm -hmm. that's where everything was already happening for me. And then when I got into music, it just was like instant fast lane. Like right. I was just like, oh, wait, they want to put out a record of mine? I'm, I'm actually not even, I haven't learned <laughs> any, anything yet. And I remember at like 19 years old, I would already had my first record out of high school, and I was like, oh, I, I still need to learn some things. But it just, it was like flat, fast lane mm -hmm. right away. I was like, oh, we want you to go on tour and then put out this album, put out this record. And it, it was wild. But I've always had a love for the visual arts mm -hmm. and found, you know, an insane amount of inspiration from, you know, architecture to, you know, to... I mean, anything, you know, video installations to, you know, I mean, I, I have a, and people that follow me know that occasionally I post a lot of uh, videos and, and, you know, sort of digital art and stuff mm -hmm. that I'm interested in and, and, and this, this other side that, that, I, that I find that can be really inspirational as far as just seeing something that kind of makes you think a different way about right. something. And uh, architecture is just... Mo I would say late modern architecture, like Frank Gehry. Frank Gehry's a huge inspiration, and Richard Rogers, and um, Morphosis, some of these really advanced architectural firms that design these crazy buildings that look like stealth bombers kind of hanging out, <laughs> you know? And uh, I love that stuff, because um, when I think about music, it's, you know, it's like, it's, it's you know, it's similar to the, uh, if you look at, in the art world, the principles of design. You've got texture, repetition, and color, and you know, intensities. These are all things that relate to sound mm -hmm. in, in, in my head, because I'm a very visual sound-oriented person. So um, I like to draw diagrams a lot when I'm working on a piece. You'll see like skeletal ribs for like a section where things are kind of like the part that's split and granularly cutting away, and then there'll be a part of silence and little particles coming back up. Almost like one is a knock, is this notational. Right. mathematical pieces, um, which I was also inspired by, but I, it's a very visual architecture of how like a piece of music would be laid out. Mm -hmm. And um, that to me is just fascinating. I look at those, those 
you know, the designs and some of these buildings, and it gives me these ideas for how to organize things in a way. And right. you know, I think it's like very much like architectural based audio for me. Mm -hmm. And um, at least with my music, I think some other people might think that's uh, right. a bit extreme. But <laughs> have, you, have you ever had uh, an inclination to take any of those graphic sketches? Mm -hmm. graphic notation of your pieces and give them to acoustic musicians and let them play and see what they come up with? I, ha I haven't done that yet, but I, I would love that. That would be, be excellent. That would be really, really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I've used um, image to synthesis software like MetaSynth and, um, you know, or take in images and then apply it to uh, additive synthesis, you know, using sine waves and different partials to do different things. And um, I I'm fascinated by that, too, just mm -hmm. kind of seeing what, you know, what an image might do and, and output that to a sound file. But, I mean, that would be, that would be a dream. I would love that. Yeah, it would be very interesting, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, I would, yeah, I mean, if I had the opportunity, I would jump on it. I've played in some ensembles like that where, where everyone's just kind of given a picture and you play the picture and it, it's oh. just, you know, there's not really a time to it or anything. It's a very so interesting... So it's your, more based on interpretation? or You're is interpreting it the visual in front visual. of you. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, an interesting yeah. thing. The composer has to be willing to let go. Yeah, it's just, just like, just right. say, here's, here's what it is, let's see what you come up with, you yeah. know, kind of a thing. So it's that's it's yeah. an interesting exercise. Yeah, that, I mean, that results in some in interesting music, too. Sometimes. Sure, yeah, I mean, you'll probably discover a lot of things um, with that approach, you know, I mean, that's very similar to what, you know, I'll look at something and be like, well, that's inspired me to just kind of, puts me in a certain headspace, right. if you will, and then something will happen from that, right? Um, from seeing or experience something that I've seen and, you know. Right, but, right. Cool yeah, jumping cool. point. Yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> so you're here with Tune Track, and you, you mentioned uh, Easy Drummer 2 and Beat Station. What is it about those those uh, those tools that allows you to make music, and what's what's inspiring about those? Well, I um, I met like well, I guess I got introduced to Tune Track back in 2008, and uh, my friend Brad used to work for them, mm -hmm. and uh, he introduced me to their software. I, I knew who they were. I didn't know a whole lot about them, and um, he, we, we played a couple shows together, and he had, you know, it was like after the show one night, he showed me on his laptop. He's like, oh, check out Easy Drummer. I work with this company. We've been designing a lot of their drum libraries and, and so forth. And um, I was amazed at how easy it was to use it. I mean, hence mm -hmm. the name, Easy Drummer. Right, right. I thought it was a, a, a kind of a funny name. But then when he showed me how fast, because I work a lot with MIDI, MIDI programming, MIDI mm -hmm. data still. A lot of my friends are... If you look at a lot of my electronic producer friends, they're pretty much all Ableton. They're using just elastic audio to do everything. But I'm kind of more old school because mm -hmm. I came from using hardware Our samplers brush, yeah. like the Akai. I had everything from the Akai 3000 series all the way up to the 6000. So I was doing a lot of still MIDI programming and right. stuff. And then Native Instruments with Contact, all MIDI programming and battery. And then when I saw Tune Tracks, I loved the idea that they were so focused around MIDI data. Mm -hmm. And being able to take... Uh, a big thing that I do is I recycle a lot of MIDI data. When I work on a track, there's tons of MIDI data that gets accumulated during the process, and there's all these cool things that I will, will come up with, and then I just drag them over to the right, and I store all the MIDI files at the end of the track, and then I'll pull stuff in and try different things out. Hmm. And, uh, and I would build a composition that way by doing the drums. You know, They might have not been normal drums, but that was basically how I would do stuff with my samplers. Um, when I saw the tune track stuff, I was really blown away by how they organized all the MIDI data. I was mm -hmm. like, this is really cool. You could preview stuff. You could, you know, quickly, in real time, play with stuff and just drag and drop mm -hmm. things really easy. I was like, this is so much better right. with, how it, and with it, how, how it deals with MIDI and how to organize stuff really quickly. And then the second thing I really liked was just how amazing their stuff sounded. I mean, I was mm -hmm. always looking for high-quality um, drum kits. And uh, the, the stuff that came with Logic and some of the stuff I was using, was our, it was very mediocre stuff. And then the, at the level of detail, the amount of trouble they went through to record some of these kits. Uh, I, was, I, I got Drummer Superior after that. Like mm -hmm. Brad got me connected to that. And I was just like, oh, my God, this is like, if Sounds you've ever cool. wanted a most insanely recorded drum kit, because um, I do a lot of TV work as mm -hmm. well, a lot of TV commercials and work on video games and stuff where I need those sort of sounds really quickly um, and they need to sound good right out of the box. I mean, I, I'd never have to do anything to their stuff or I'd just drop it in a track and I'm like, oh my gosh, I mean, maybe right. a little EQ here and there, but I mean, it, it just sounds phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, the quality results you get uh, with very little effort, 
if you're under a tight deadline, which I'm on pretty much 99% of the right. time. I don't have time to go out and record a yeah. full session drummer with all this stuff, and um, their stuff has just saved me on many occasions. Right, right. And, uh, and they're just, it's really fun to use, like the, the Easy Drummer, especially with the Easy Drummer 2, which they've just taken to a whole new level mm. with, the, with the song arrangement feature. And I mean, that's crazy, where it just analyzes the minimal amount of data and then will generate results based off that. Right. And uh, I'd been following them for a while when Drum Tracker came out, being able to analyze, you know, you know, audio and convert to MIDI and I like, you know, like drum replacement stuff as, as that started to get more popular. Um, I just was blown away by all of you know, everything that they were working on. And, um, but I've just been obsessed with the way they've, they've got really smart algorithms for mm -hmm. dealing with MIDI, organizing MIDI, helping you organize an arrangement using either MIDI that you're coming up with or mm -hmm. you could just try out different MIDI patterns from different drummers that they've recorded. And of course they've recorded an, an amazing, you know, collection of, of drummers from, you know, the best jazz and rock metal. And, and it's just interesting to see what those guys do. I, right. I often just dump a lot of their MIDI in and study it and just look at it. I'm just fascinated by what other people do, how they're right. constructing things. and. Um, to me, I think that's really interesting. I, I, I would almost pay more to just see somebody, to see how they, like a drummer put some, puts their arrangements together than to get some piece of software that just, you know, I don't know. It's, I feel like I'm getting a little more out of them, getting the DNA of somebody, mm -hmm. studying the DNA, the basic level of their brain. Right. And how they put something together. And I think that's what drew me to working with, with the tune track. Right. Line. They were really focused on that, which was cool. It's not just high quality drums, but we're gonna also give you we're gonna really give you the DNA, the bottom the real meat of what what the essence of like what makes this all work. Right. And I think they have a really good understanding with that. And, Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, so Yeah, I, I like that you can even though you, you have all the, the MIDI patterns and the hard MIDI data, it's still malleable. So exactly. you can go in and they have, they've analyzed all these drummers' styles and so you can add percentages of more complexity or less complexity. Or less complexity, you know, or I Add your own little beats in here and there and exactly. things and very easily do all that stuff and it just flows. It totally so. flows and I think that uh, it's just, it's just mind-boggling to me. I love that whole aspect that, you know, they've gone through the trouble of doing that. And, right. You know, for people like me that want to generate cool ideas and stuff really quickly, I think that's just genius. I think it's genius. Yeah. And uh, I love anything that... I love anything that's like that, you yeah. know, <laughs> hardware, yeah. software, you know, and I think they did a really good job and they didn't, it's great if you, if there's nothing that's hidden away, mm -hmm. you know, there's very few, uh, I mean, the functions, everything you need to get to is just, it's right there in front of you, there's not a lot of hidden menus or, you know, you know menu diving to get to all the most essential things that you need, so I, I find it just the workflows are, are really nice for the kind of stuff that I do. Right, and um, I'm surprised that not that other uh, other electronic musicians don't use it more, because I think uh, they will. I think so too. Yeah, because you could you don't necessarily like I said you don't necessarily have to use it to like I use it a lot just as like a MIDI player just mm -hmm. to help me play stuff and could be playing other instruments and stuff. It just generates such cool, you know, right. phrases and you want to build a whole little sequence drum track. It's I think it's genius. Mm -hmm. So right. it's super cool. Well, we're looking forward to your workshop tonight where you're going to be putting those tools to work mm -hmm. and showing us all how to, uh, how to get the most out of them and everything. It's going to be uh, very exciting. I'm looking forward to it. Totally. Hopefully, yeah. I, yeah, I've got a couple examples. Just um, I'm working on a new project right now where I'm using them on, a, this, on an album project back in Georgia. And I'm using, I'll show three examples of how I've been using Easy, uh, Easy Drummer and that. And then uh, I'll show a more kind of advanced, kind of weird example of how I use Easy Drummer, Drummer to come up with like variations really quickly. And then I have like a chain of plugins that I apply different processes to my, you know, electronic drum sounds and I like stamp those out, bounce them out a little bit at a time to create these sort of weird mutated constructed rhythmic, you know, implied, I don't know what you want to call it. Awesome. Globs of strangeness. And, uh, well, that's awesome. And uh, yeah, it should be pretty cool. That's going to be fun. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. You, uh, you have to come back because there's so much more to talk about. Your career is so varied and we haven't even touched on uh, many, many aspects of there's it. There's a so, lot, yeah. So please come back. Definitely. Well, to have you. Thank you for having me. It's, it's an honor to be oh, here. It's really our is. pleasure. Thank you. I'm Mitch Gallagher. Thanks for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute.